All right, welcome into Hoist the Colors on this Sunday night, a victorious Sunday night. It is the Bucks on the Pond podcast. We are live on YouTube, live on Facebook. Jonathan Wagner, Steve and I go here on your screen, and we're missing somebody. Where's he at? Where is where is Scott Lorbacher? Oh, there he is. There is the, the, the freshly shaven. Scott Lorbacher is here. Before. You lived up to your word. Uh, we should we should maybe wait for all the bots and everybody to get on board. But hey, we're already at seventy plus viewers. They're here to see your face, Scott. How does it feel? The beard is gone. Uh, horrible. Uh, it burns. I don't like it. And uh, but whatever it takes. Also, if we would have lost to uh, FAU today, as it felt like at times during that game, I would have uh, just not came. So. Uh, great job for the Pirates to, to pull through and score eight unanswered. And uh, now that we've won in Raleigh, hopefully I don't have to sacrifice any more of myself for uh, winning. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you're not familiar, so Scott did guarantee he would shave his beard if ECU won at NC State. They did that. He followed through, and uh, I'm proud of you, man. I'll be honest. Uh, props to you for following through. There was no hesitation, right? No, I did. Uh, I did have my first game as a youth soccer coach for five and six year olds yesterday. So I did wait until after that because I did not want to traumatize any of the uh, any of the any of the youths out there on the uh, on the soccer field. Um, and what does your wife think? She hates it uh, very much. So. so. <laughs> All right. Well, let me see if I can get our camera right again. Nope. <laughs> There, there we, we go. Are. There we go. There's the normal camera. Uh, so props to Scott. Yeah, maybe I'll just mess with this this camera thing the whole time. And uh, I tell you what, Scott, you deserve to be on top today for your hard work. So there you go. Uh, okay. And for following through on your word. All right. So the comments section off and running. JPN twelve twelve has already had a full conversation with himself. We'll get into those comments. ECU, guys, goes on the road. They went three out of four this week. They beat NC State. Then they take two out of three in very adventurous fashion. But get it done at Florida Atlantic. And we talked about it going into the week. If ECU found a way to go three and one or better, they would be setting themselves up in great shape. They did just that. Now they get 10 of the next 11 at home. I think they only have 10 road games left in the uh, the regular season. Might not honestly be more than that. Might even be seven. I have to do some double-checking. Um, but there's not a lot of road games left compared to home games. So big week. Let's go around the horn. Thoughts on the week that was. We'll start with uh, Wax. Yeah, I think it was a really big week, and it was frustrating at times. Um, the state game was just honestly pure domination. I think from start to finish, that's how it felt. So that was nice to see. I didn't expect that. I thought it'd be at the very least a hard fought win that came down to probably one or two plays at the end, and. 12 to four, and it was really not that close. Um, yeah, that was a great way to start the week. And then down in Boca Raton and Florida Atlantic, it was a it was a heck of a weekend. And I don't mean that all good, but you win the opener, you lose the second one on a walk off, in very frustrating fashion. And then Sunday, today it came down to a big rally by the offense, and without it, you lose a series, and who knows what happens. But it, it felt like a really big week to me because I think, you know, as we talk throughout the game, if you see wins, like we said, go three and one this week, um, that's a very good week and you're in a good spot moving forward. But if you see a loss today and lost a series and it feels like, oh, wow, everyone's hitting the panic button and what's going to happen now. But, you know, we were without stalling this week, but now we're going from a lot of people probably think you lose a series and you're probably on the outside looking into the hosting picture potentially. Um, I think that's a bit of an overreaction post personally, but and but now you win it and you're probably going to move up to top eight uh, in the rankings tomorrow. So really good week when it came down to it. And I think there's still a lot to improve on though. So that's not to be forgotten. Uh, C-Town Pirate 1 points out 18 home games left, seven away. Uh, so you have seven road games left, 10 of the next 11 at home. All right, Scott, your thoughts on the week that was ECU win three out of four? Yeah, how about uh, the pitching performance on Tuesday and just an, an offensive output? And then, you know, you go into today really needing a win for that not to all to kind of go to waste. And I think Wags made a good point on if we lose today, 
the hosting picture, the national hosting seed hosting picture, they're all very, very far away. Um, if, if we can't if pull through with a win today, and and now looking at it, you played your two toughest conference conference road opponents on the road, gotten away with uh, about a three and three record, and now you have the rest of the season with I don't want to say worse, but less successful teams at home, and everything's still right in front of you. And with the chaos that happened in the top 10 and top 25 this week, we'll, we'll be looking at a probably a top eight ranking come out tomorrow and everything very much in, in our control to, to be a national seed. RPI is up to eight um, with some, with a big road, uh, with road games this week, four road games, and three wins. So, you know, keep it going, keep that RPI uh, above 10 and, you know, win the conference tournament and maybe we're a six or a seven seed and not even, not even an eight, but like even better than that. Yeah. And the, the most amazing thing is guys, ECU is in this position and I still feel like there is like Wag said, a ton of room for improvement and consistency. Like they're still not playing. I don't think a the cleanest brand of baseball we know with Cliff Goblin, typically the team does kind of peak late April uh, into May. Uh, for the most part. So I, I still feel like this team's best baseball is in front of them. 18 home games, seven on the road. You look at the road games left, you know, maybe not the best from an RPI perspective, but you go to Memphis, you have William and Mary in a midweek game, and then you also go to Rice. I mean, those are seven very winnable road games. And then all your home games, you know, ECU is 13 and one at home. So you feel very good playing home regardless of who's coming in here. Obviously, USF, Wichita. We'll talk more about the conference race later. State and Duke still coming and Campbell. So you got some big home games and some winnable road games. I think that sets up well. Uh, ECU obviously still has to go out and play well. Uh, we'll get into the bullpen discussion. We'll get into the conference race. We'll get into FAU's crappy uniforms. Uh, we'll get into Scott Rogers sitting outside in a tent um, and all that and more. But I, I just thought, guys, the, the swing of emotions today – you know, you go down three nothing. Everybody's panicking. Take a huge lead. Eric Ritchie comes in. Obviously, he probably has the worst outing of his life. You know, can't throw a strike. All of a sudden, like the game is on the line. Shinkman delivers again. Just uh, and then closing it out. You have the error, and then the next pick pitch. You have Barini Turner double play. So it was just a crazy Sunday, an adventurous Sunday in the American. But to find a way to win, no matter how ugly or pretty it was, I thought was crucial. Um, so let's uh, let's get into maybe some of the specifics again. Drop your comments, questions. We'll get uh, to those throughout. Let's let's talk kind of game by game this weekend, guys. Uh, specifically starting with Friday, because uh, I, I we got to talk about Trey Savage, man. He is he's been so good and seven dominant innings. His splitter is nasty. Um, what was it? Eleven strikeouts again. Wags. He was just a beast once again Friday. Yeah, Trey is just being Trey, and that's really good. And, and I think even when he works himself into trouble, he's and I've said it before, but he's a pro-level pitcher in the way that he works around stuff. When he does walk someone, when guys do come through and they poke hits through, which didn't happen very often this week, or when a defense makes an error behind you, um, it doesn't face him. He just he steps back on the mound, he makes his pitch, and he usually does what it needs to. And if he keeps pitching like this, um, ECU is going to be in a good position – um, pretty much no matter who you're facing in a regional or a super regional, especially because when you have Trey Savage, you're probably going to win. And at this point, even if you're going up against another ace, um, if Trey Savage is pitching like that, then I'm taking ECU. Um, so it's really good. And especially you look at the AAC teams and I don't want to, you know, talk down on FAU, but, I don't think Let's they were it. as – look, all these teams suck offensively. Let's be real. And I think there are some teams that are better than others in this conference, and I think some of those good offensive teams we haven't quite faced yet. UTSA is kind of a scrappy offensive team like that. But – but and it's not just these bad teams that Trey's doing it against. We've seen it against UNC. We've seen it in the postseason before. So – yeah, if Trey's going after the bump, I'm 100% co- not 100% confident. I'm never 100% confident in ECU, but I, more often than not, I, I think ECU is going to win, and that's all because of Trey. And if he can go give you six, seven, eight innings every single Friday night, 
especially with the bullpen issues that this team has right now that I know we're going to get into later, then you only need an any out of your bullpen two tops on Friday nights. It, that value goes way beyond the field. Yeah, Trey, I mean, the only game somebody really hit them was UTSA when they had the signs you know, or were, were tipping pitches or whatever the situation was. So um, <clears throat> he's been a beast. Um, Scott, I'll let you touch on Saturday's game. Also, Pirate wants to know, are you drinking milk with ice? No, this is a ginger ale, so no. Um, uh, I don't drink milk. Uh, with uh, milk is disgusting. So, yeah. Um, uh, I can't do that. Speaking of disgusting – Saturday's finish. <laughs> yeah, everything you wanted, right? Uh, no, it's just, it was a crazy game. It's just there are times where I feel like we we struggle to close out games, and that was one of them. Um, but yeah, and and I think it goes to being able to trust more guys out of the bullpen. I, I just don't know how you stick with Danny there when he clearly doesn't have his best stuff. And I thought maybe not even bringing him out for the ninth would have been the right call. And then it becomes a question of who do you go to? Um, and Jay Hunter was the guy last weekend. I thought it would be him this weekend, but we saw what he could do today. So, you know, maybe the right call was to save him today. But, um, you know, we, we've discussed this all year. You have to be able to rely on more than two or three guys out of the bullpen. And when – Bill doesn't have it. He's a guy who's had to sit out with soreness already once this year, and I really didn't think he was effective in any inning that he pitched on Saturday. And I, I just didn't like going back to him for the ninth. And, you know, we hadn't seen Jaden Winter in forever. Maybe he's a guy who throws hard. A guy, you know, and I don't think FAU has seen somebody that, you know, really throws hard a ton this year. So, you know, maybe go that direction, but I, I think we have to find another two or three guys that maybe you don't rely on them in critical situations the way that you do Bill and Shink, but you rely on them in, uh, you know, when you're up. I don't know how much we were up at NC State when Shink was still pitching, but those situations, um, and there's been other times too, but I think, I think the lack of development of additional bullpen arms or lack of willing to use them really was apparent on Saturday, and I think it bit us. All right, we'll come back to Sunday, uh, this game today. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on the bullpen now. I mean, we get a lot of comments. And, look, I mean, it's a fair discussion. We've talked about this a lot. All right, so you look at it, guys. I mean, at this point, ECU, over the last two to three weeks, is basically an eight-man pitching staff. Obviously, you got Trey Savage. you got Zach Root. you got Wyatt lunsford Shinkman, You have Danny Bill. Uh, those are, I would say, the the main main guys. Uh, and then Norby has started to pitch more. That's five. Uh, Groller has pitched some. That's six. And then you got Jake Hunter and Eric Ritchie. And, and outside of that, I mean, Chris Kaler started some midweek games, but like, there's no, you know, the the depth after that. There's just a severe drop off. And you could really say, once you get past Wyatt, you Savage, Root, and uh, Danny Bill. And I would, I guess, include Jake Hunter in that mix. Like, there's a pretty severe drop off in terms of usage. And I mean, Eric Ritchie's in that mix. He's had 15 appearances. Bills had 17. Lunsford Shinkman's had 16. But as far as guys you trust, like I trust Danny Bill and I trust Shinkman. And then the rest is just kind of cross your fingers. I mean, when Ritchie's on, he's good. But when he's off, like today, it's, he can't throw strikes. So they just got to develop more depth. And you know, it was good to see Groller pitch well in the midweek. But they got to find a role for Jaden Winter. Uh, they got to find a, a way to get DiLorenzo more involved. Uh, find a, the better role for Chris Kaler. Like Drew Bryan hasn't pitched since the Carolina series. He was a guy who was a D three All American or whatever. Um, you know Corey Costello. I know he had a rough start, but there, there's other arms they can use. I guess the from my perspective, I'm glad they have a five game week. Yes, it'll test them, but it'll force them to use other arms. So. I don't know, Wags. What do you what do you make of the situation and the fact that we're seeing basically the same guys again and again? And I get it on one hand, but on the other hand, you, you got to develop more depth. Yeah, it, it's frustrating to watch. Um, like Scott said on Tuesday, I think he had a nine run lead against State, and I look over to the bullpen. I'm like, why the hell is Wyatt Lunter Shankman warming up? And I'm like, this makes no sense. I thought it was stupid, and I stand by it. And 
I mean, th- that's a situation you have to get other guys in. Like you said, Jackson DiLorenzo, Jaden Winter, um, perfect spot for those types of guys. And, you know, I think coming into the season, a lot of us circled um, this past week um, at NC State and then at FAU is probably the most important week of the season, um, four tough road games. And now that we're here in the moment, I think this upcoming week might be the most important moving forward. Because like you said, five game weeks, you got to figure Chris Kaler probably starts one of the games and I would guess Aaron Grohler gets the other, but it's, you, you can't expect both of them to really give you four. I don't think um, it just doesn't feel like that's going to happen on back-to-back days. So those two guys are going to start. You're going to have to use other guys. And I think it's important too. And in past years, I think we've gone through conference play with the same two bullpen arms, whether it's the bridges and Colmore to whoever, And typically you kind of run through conference play. You're going to win the league with ease. And this year it's a lot of close games and it's a lot of tight situations where you need to go to your guy because almost every situation has been a high leverage situation. So that plays into it too. But when you get to the postseason, I mean, we've seen it before. And I think we talked about this last week, but you know, Texas super regional, you burn through everyone in your bullpen almost. And you get there and it's Bradley Wilson and, Wyatt Luncher Chankman, who's not experienced at that point, warming up. And those are two guys that in that situation, you probably want them to get more high leverage situations earlier in the season and not have their first real thrown to the fire moment be in a super regional with your back on the back against the wall. And you're going to run out of opportunities. I do think ECU is going to get on a winning streak. I think they're going to start winning. And I think the margins of victory are going to start getting bigger. So you have no excuse to get other guys involved moving forward. Jackson DiLorenzo has been good when he's come in. Aaron Goler, whether he turns into a midweek guy, um, he's been good, I think. So he's another guy, and you have no excuse, and you're going to regret it if you don't. So this week is the week, and if you don't do it this week, I don't know if you ever are. Yeah, I mean, it's like I understand on one hand why the coaches go to the same guys because, again, it is trust, but like – I think the most frustrating thing for me, Scott, is when they're they do have a five, six, seven run lead, and we see, you know, Shinkman or Bill in there, and it's like, all right, this is the chance to get De Lorenzo. And I've got a lot of questions on De Lorenzo, and we asked Coach Godwin at last week's coaches show, uh, you know, unless there's something going on, I don't know about. It. He said he's fine, and they just didn't have to use him last week, and obviously that was the case again this week. So, um, as far as I know, he's healthy. These uh, these guys are healthy. They're just not getting the call. So. Um, but I just think they're not going to have a chance, or they're not going to have a choice this week. They got to use somebody else, uh, Scott. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you saw what could happen tonight. Uh, we had we had a five run lead. Richie comes in, doesn't throw strikes, and then all of a sudden it's a two run lead. Uh, and then the bases are loaded, and things get a little bit hairy there in the in the late innings. But I think that's where you start trying other guys. What and and you still have your your frontline bullpen guys available. Um, but we got to get them some work. And, you know, you look at Elon as a team that has not had a lot of success this year. Um, Old Dominion, I think, is a right around 500 ball club. If you can get to to those pitching staffs early and score some runs, then let's get DiLorenzo, let's get Jaden Winter in, let's get Drew Bryan in, let's get some guys in, see what they have. Uh, you know, we saw Charlie Hodges come in once. Um, I think it was maybe against Columbia and, and looked pretty solid and then struggle the next time out. So the more and more often that we can see these guys live and, and uh, see what they have, then I think that's going to only strengthen this, this bullpen going forward. And look, I mean, it, you know, we're calling for these guys to pitch. It doesn't mean that they're going to go out there and pitch well. Like, I mean, the offense has to pick up some slack too. You know, if you, Five game week, realistically, all these guys that get opportunity this week, hopefully, um, you're going to have some ups and downs. The offense is going to, you know, I think going to be challenged this week to score some runs, but you're playing at home. You're playing against some pitching staffs you should be able to hit. Uh, Charlotte, I think, get 45 runs over four games this week. Uh, they, they've walked a bunch of guys, and you got, you know, two midweek games that you should be able to hit the ball against Elon. Definitely has an ERA over seven, and then an ODU, I think, is a solid team, but not unbeatable. So, offense has to step up, but you also – you got to develop more arms. We've talked about this. They've got to find a way to rest. You know, Bill Shinkman, and there's a discussion going on on the board about how Shinkman 
threw 110 pitches over three uh, outings this week. And somebody was like, well, that's how much you savage threw. But I think it's different when you're throwing three out of four times, uh, out of four games, and multiple innings each time, high-stress situations. Like, those pitches take a toll. And you want Shankman fresh for the, the postseason. So, um I think that's the key, guys. I mean, look, this team, I know they're not perfect offensively, but with the starting rotation as it is, even if you just find one or two more dependable arms down the stretch, I think this team is going to be a very tough out in the postseason. But that that's a valid question at this point, Wags, that I think, you know, I, I, I think you made a good point. Like, they're kind of running out of time to, to get that done. Like, this is the time of the season you want that development to happen, I would say. Yeah, for sure. And it's a big week to do it. I mean, Charlotte's not the team on paper that I think most expected them to be this season. But still, coming into the year, this was the kind of the weekend everyone circled as like, you know, this is the series that we want. We really want to win. In-state opponent, Charlotte, let's go Let's go beat the crap out of them. Um, so, yeah, it'd be a good week. And, again, five games, you have to. Um and it, it gets frustrating sometimes when you see a good Trey Savage start, you see a good Zach Root start, and whether it's the offense not supporting them enough or the bullpen not closing it down or both, it's frustrating to not – it feels like, you know, ECU's got a pretty good record right now. It feels like it should be even better just because when you have those two guys and they're pitching as well as they are, you should win more often than not on every Friday and every Saturday. So, and stuff's going to happen. Defense needs to be better, too, as much as we're talking about Wolfman. That has not helped anybody, I don't think. It uh, certainly didn't this weekend. Ethan Orby, I thought, pitched well today, but the defense completely crapped itself behind him. Um, and that's kind of become a theme, too. But So, it's everything. It's offense, pitching, and defense. I don't think we've seen that come together, all three of those facets of the game at the same time. When it does, this team's ceiling is really high. But when either two of those things or usually one of those things is working, I think we've seen that this team's floor can be a, little, a lot lower than my, many of us expected it to be. All right, Nick Bostic says, I feel like it's similar to the quarterback situation during the football season when we only saw one quarterback, fans one of the other quarterback. Obviously, the coaches don't owe anything to the fans. Uh, then he says, but I feel like we need to see other guys so the fans can know what we have. Obviously, we're going to call for the guys we never see. I mean, look, if the pitching depth isn't good enough, then that's on recruiting um, and goes back to the staff. Like, you just – and, again, look, I don't – I think you could go across the top 25 and you're going to see six, seven guys strong and a pitching staff get beyond that is a little murky. But we've heard this pitching staff get lauded, Scott, for the depth and versatility like the last few off seasons. But then it feels like we kind of get into the same situation where it's the same – you know, last year, what was it, Spivey, Bill, and then Ginn, once he got back from his suspension, we saw those guys like every game. And then by the time the regional rolled around, I felt like they were pretty gassed. So I just want ECU to be in the best situation possible heading into the postseason, and that's why I think we're calling for these guys. Yeah, I think it's more like the quarterback situation two years ago where you had, you had Holton, and he's going to play, but you got to find a way in games where either it's out of hand one way or another – to get the backup some experience. So one, you know what you have. And two, when they do get an opportunity and it's important, it's not their first opportunity. And I think right now we're relying really heavily on the guys that we know what they can do. And, you know, coming up, there's some games against Elon and William and Mary, no offense to them, but those are games that we should win going away. And those are opportunities to get these guys some experience. I will say with the schedule we've played so far, especially midweeks, you know, we haven't played exactly bad teams to where we've had a ton of, of huge leads. Um, you know, really state is like the one that stands out as a game where we had a, a really big lead, but didn't get a ton of, of young guys work. You know, I think they did get work in the Columbia series and the Ryder series, but those bats aren't the exact same as, you know, even FAU or, William and Mary or Old Dominion, you know, programs that have legitimate, you know, opportunities to hit home runs. So I, I hope we can get some of those guys in this week. I think we have to do it because I think Bill's arm is is only going to last so long and he's given us everything he has. All right, let's uh, circle back to the series, guys. Sunday's game, 
Um, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but you know, you get down three nothing. I, I thought that one of the major issues with ECU early in the series was the the inability to execute. I mean, really, Saturday's game, second and third, nobody out, failure to score a single run. I can't remember what inning it was, but that came back to bite ECU early in Sunday's game. It was the same situation. Runner on third, less than two outs. They couldn't get him in. I thought Colby Wallace had one of the best at bats of the weekend. Fouled off a ton of pitches. Got an RBI single. I think cut it to three two. That kind of let everybody breathe a little bit. Um, and ECU ends up scoring five uh, to take the lead one in. And so, uh, Wags, what did you make of today's game specifically? The offense and and you know Jake Hunter with a huge performance out of the the bullpen too. Yeah, like I said earlier, um, and. But like I said earlier, I think Ethan Norby didn't pitch poorly. I think, you know, a couple of errors, a couple of fluky things that happened behind him. And, you know, and can confirm that was not my microwave going off. It was my oven. <laughs> so, <laughs> mm, okay, okay. So that wasn't me this time. Don't worry. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, Norby didn't look bad today, I didn't think. I think he was on track to have another good outing today. But, you know, stuff happened behind him, ended up being shorter. But then Jay Conner just came in. <laughs> um, Jay Conner came in and pitched really well. And he kind of did the thing that we've been hoping he would do starting on Sundays for a few weeks. And he came in, he shut things down, he won you the game. And, yeah, I think Colby Wallace, offensively, he looked really good this weekend. He might not have the hits, you know, one for five today, but it feels like every at-bat he fouled off two or three two-strike pitches. And he really made the other pitchers work. And – you know, I thought he did good. And the offense just, you know, they chipped away in the third, got a run in the third, got two in the fourth, and then you had the big inning in the fifth. And, again, it, I, the offense was good. That's a good thing. They did well in the fifth. They came back. They scored so many unanswered runs. But then you didn't score an inning six through nine. So, to me, it's just I thought, I thought the, to be completely honest, I thought the situational hitting was poor this weekend. You know, you get guys on base and you strike out looking you just stuff like that and i thought that was execution was not high um when it needed to be this weekend but it was good you know you had a good inning but again you got to sustain it through nine innings i don't i don't like seeing the offense come through and be a race for the first four but they hit the last five or vice versa i think they got to put it through one through nine and we've seen what this offense can do i think and we're saying all this and jacob starling didn't play this weekend um because he was injured so Colby Wallace stepped in. Chaz Myers got an opportunity on Friday, but Colby looked good. Dixon played second base. We saw that combination for the first time. Um, so yeah, lots of up and down, ups and downs this weekend. Pitching, hitting, defense all around. But in the end, they did enough. <laughs> all right. Um, good breakdown. I'm just distracted by all the comments about food now. <laughs> Uh, somebody says, "Ha ha! Great recovery, Wags. EC Pirate Nation. What are you cooking at nine thirty at night? Well, yeah, what's going on in your oven, Scott? Uh, muffins. You gotta have muffins for breakfast in the morning. There you go. Late night muffins for the morning. I like that. Um, somebody said he is cooking at UNC Charlotte with his comments about their pitching. Uh, yeah, the Charlotte pitching has struggled, uh, which is a surprise given their head coach. Um. All right, so we've got a lot of discussion going on here, and yeah, somebody said that it's it's good to be. He says it's great to be talking about the bullpen when they have some of the best stats in the country. Look, I mean, yeah, when you have Wyatt Lunch for Chinkman, Danny Bill making the majority of your appearances, like the stats can be pretty good, and the pitching numbers overall are pretty elite. I mean, ECU pitching is holding teams to a two hundred nine average. 323 strikeouts against 98 walks and 268 innings. I mean, those are outstanding numbers. You'll take those any day. But we're just saying you got to you gotta make it last when it matters most, and that's the thing. Um, so, you know, there, there's multiple ways to look at it. We just want to see more depth, which nobody has enough pitching depth, and uh, that's just something we, we brought up, though. All right, somebody said – let's see, I had a comment I was going to read off. Um all right, have we talked about Eric Ritchie yet? So we kind of touched on him. I mean, y'all can expand on this after I give my thoughts. Eric Ritchie, I think, is has great stuff. It's just – it simply comes down to strike throwing. I mean, he has now hit seven guys and walked 12 and 19 innings. That's one free pass per inning. He has struck out 25, and opponents are only hitting 197 against him. But if you can't throw strikes – 
Scott, it doesn't matter. So it's, I think at this point, I'm fine using Richie. You just got to pick your spots, and you got to know if he doesn't have it early, you you have to do a quick hook. And if he has it, you roll with him. Yeah, fastball for a strike. And he's not a guy that if he can't get his fastball over, then teams are just going to sit on the curveball and not swing at it. Um, I think he had 14 pitches and like six were strikes or something like that on Tuesday night. It, and it was it was bad. And, you know, kind of more of the same today. And going forward – it's just pound the zone for him. You got to, you got to be able to get your fastball over. And, you know, I trust Austin Knight, whether it's a mechanic issue or a mental issue, sometimes it can be a little bit of both, but that if he doesn't have a fastball command, then, you know, I, I'm not sure that he's someone that you can really trust to come out of the pen in any game, because if you're hitting guys and walking guys and putting people on base, and then you're relying on one pitch against a lot of the teams we, we play, they're going to hit the ball out of the park, and if you've already put two on, all of a sudden a six-run game becomes a three-run game, and and we just can't have that. So um, hopefully he'll have some time this week to to get it corrected, and maybe the next time we see him out of the pen, it'll, he'll be uh, throwing more strikes than he has the last couple of times. All right, Golf Yoda says in all caps, please, I go. Tell me what is wrong with Cam Clanch. I feel like he's living literally six feet under where the doghouse used to be. Look, I mean, we, we talked about this last week. We had Cam Clanch on the show, um, uh, on the Hoist of Colors uh, radio show, I should say, not on this show. <laughs> um, but uh, Cliff Galvin talked about him last Monday. Like, it's just one of those situations where he knows Cam wants to play more, and Cam said he would like to play more. But uh, this this is just kind of how it's worked out. A lot of it is honestly goes back to Carter Cunningham being moved to first. He's hitting like an All-American. Riley Johnson, I don't think they ever anticipated would be healthy enough to play. So he's playing center instead of Bristol Carter. And then Bristol Carter's playing left, meaning Carter Cunningham is playing first where Cam Clonch could play. And then Chaz Myers got to start this week. So, look, I still want to see Cam Clonch get more bats, but uh, – When's the last time Cam Clanch had in a bat? Did, did anybody look that up? Um, it's been a long, long like time. A long time. I feel like you got one last week. I got my scorebook here. I'll scroll. I'll I'll flip through. I'll see if I. We'll see if Wags can find out. But um, while he does that, Scott, I mean, we've still both said Clanch is going to have his shot. Um, I agree. I would like to see him pinch hit over Luke Nowak in certain situations, given his power, but uh. It is what it is, man. I, I hate it for Clanch, but I don't I don't know if it's gonna change anytime soon. Yeah, and you look at Ryan McChrystal's emergence as the yep. kind of de facto DH. Um, and then you know, you're gonna keep Wilcoxon uh in the lineup when uh McChrystal's catching. So it's it's that I, I do think we see Bristol Carter kind of get pinch hit for a lot late in games and it's to me situationally, it makes more sense to pinch hit Clanch. And even if you put Noak in the field and left, um, personally, I think that we're a better defensive team with, with Carter Cunningham and left and Clanch at first than we are with Noak and left and, and Carter at first. But that's neither here nor there. But yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly opportunities to be had. But then I guess the question is. Do you want to burn two guys to do that? If it's pinch hit, clanch, and then uh, put in no whack and left for clanch after clanch is pinch hit, you've now burnt through two of your top guys off the bench, at least in my opinion. So I don't think that's always the smartest decision either. Uh, but he's certainly a guy that I think going forward should be playing a much larger role on this team, especially as far as the first bat off the bench. Um, and if it's we're pinch hitting for Bristol, typically it's because um, it's a it's a righty righty matchup, and and I think Clanch would be a guy that you would want in that situation. So I, I want to see him more. I think we all do. I'm just not sure it'll happen at this point. It's been 30 games. We've called for it every week. So, uh, Wags, have you found his last at bat or played a? Yeah, it took me. Was. This is the, it took me back to the first page of the scorebook when I ran out of pages in my last one. But it was game three against UTSA. He pinch hit for Bristol Carter in the eighth, and he struck out. So it's been two weeks. Yeah. And look, like, Clonch is one of those guys, and 
I think he's had his moments, you know, just this year specifically. We've seen what he can do in the past, but this year I do think he's had a couple more at-bats where he looks kind of, I don't want to say lost, but, you know, some ugly strikeouts, I think. But, again, I've said it before. I said it last year with him. But what do you expect when a guy's coming off cold, sitting two or three weeks off the it's bench? pressing a little bit, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, I think back to the, you know, pinch hit, picking your spots, I think – to me, it feels like we're pinch hitting less this year than ECU teams typically do. You know, a lot of times in previous years, it feels like, you know, random times, you know, in the six, you're pinch hitting and going for the righty-lefty matchup or vice versa. But this year, it feels less of that. But I agree. I don't like, you know, I want Bristol Carter in the lineup, and I want him in the game in the late innings because of his speed and the difference he can make there, and I like his bat. But, yeah, it's just you got to pick your spots. And – you know, we've talked we've talked a lot about, you know, giving guys days off. And in the end, like, you never know when someone's going to get hurt. You know, Jacob Starling not playing this weekend, it presented an opportunity for Kobe Wallace. So for Cam, it's just you got to keep working as, as much as everyone on the outside is going to hate it. You just got to keep working. You got to be ready because you never know when you're going to get your chance. And if it comes down to it, if he's forced into action and he's playing two, three times a week, I'm going to be pretty comfortable with him. All right, Robert Matthews, this is way off topic, but I, I'm scrolling through the comments. I do want to address it. He says, uh, off topic, did John Gilbert ever say if there would be an equipment sale? There will not be an equipment sale this spring, around the spring game. They don't have enough equipment uh, left over. They are shooting for the fall, uh, but there will not be an equipment sale this spring. So random nugget there. Um, all right, let's get into the crappy uniforms discussion. Uh, you, FAU is an Adidas school, and uh, – I mean, just honestly, guys, the the single worst set of baseball uniforms, Pee Wee, college, high school, pro, you name it. What in the hell is – who is designing this? Who is approving it? What is going on in Boca Raton? Scott, this was, uh, this was an embarrassment to the game of baseball, I would say. It's a subject that came up at the beginning of every game in our group chat, was how bad – FAU's uniforms were. There was just so much going on on, on every single one. The the owls down like the center of the chest. I don't think I've ever. It looked like a tie. Like I, what are you doing? And then, I mean, I, the, I don't even remember what they looked like yesterday. But the, today, like the old school White Sox was okay. Like that's not like the worst thing in the world. But then the pants had like some weird piping on the side. They had the giant owl logo on their hat. And then, I, oh, yeah, yesterday they had the uh, the hat with just the state of Florida on it, which, I mean, anybody in Florida, I guess, could wear that hat and it would be fine. But you, you have a school with red, white, and blue, which is pretty versatile uh, color combination. And then owl as your mascot, which is, while not unique in the American – unique overall in, in college athletics. I think there's only four, at least that play football, that are the Owls. So you, you have stuff you can do, and to, and to come up with the three uniforms they put together is is a rough look. Um, maybe maybe it is Adidas. You know, they can't get two grays to match. So they, they if they can't get two grays to match, who knows what they're doing with, with FAU. Um but, yeah, they got a lot to work on down there. I'm looking at Saturday's uniforms. It's the Navy top with, like, Florida small, but then Atlantic, Atlantic big. big. And but there's it's no like, outline not, on Florida, right? Like, it's just yeah. red on blue. It's It was kind of hard to see, yeah. And it's, like, it's not even, like, at the top center of the jersey. It's, like, at the bottom of their chest, and then, like, the numbers squish beneath it below like on the right side, like nothing makes any sense. Um, it all looks terrible. Wags, uh, your thoughts? Yeah, just really pitiful. Um, yeah, I think today I didn't hate the jersey itself today. You know, kind of like Scott said, the throwback White Sox look. Um, I like that jersey itself, but when you combine the pants and the hat, it made it look awful. And, yeah, the tie on Friday, just the – what was it pinstripes and then the blue down the right down the chest it just looks so stupid 
And like, I know we're spoiled, you know, we have some of the best uniforms in the country, but God, I mean, that was one of the first things we talked about when we started watching on Friday is just, what are they wearing? And it didn't get any better. Yeah, it was bad. Um, the, in the center field camera, uh, so <laughs> we've got several comments about that. Like it was just like randomly shaking. And uh, Golf Yoda says, I felt like I uh, watched the whole series hanging off the side of a boat. The waters were rough. Um, yeah, I mean, there were times like you would just be watching a pitch and it was just like, sh- you know, shaking <laughs> back and forth. I don't know what was happening out there. The guy um, that kept walking this. in front of Scooter was just walking in front of that <laughs> camera too. He's just rotating who is walking in front of him. Yeah, let's talk about that too. So Scooter, uh, he, if you watch the highlight video he posted on uh, ECU Sports Network one one day for the game, as he's calling a home run of uh, Jacob Jenkins Cowart, uh, I guess that was Friday, there was a person getting up out of their seat and like crawling over Scooter as he's calling the home run. And so uh, no press facility there at FAU Baseball Stadium. Which, like, if your baseball stadium is named like FAU Baseball Stadium, you know it sucks, um, and it does. And so, like, these—I mean, it's just an embarrassment, honestly, for the conference to like welcome these schools into the league and they're not have even adequate facilities to house, whether it be media, opposing teams, et cetera. Like, it, it, it's just embarrassing. So, Scooter had to call the game from outside. He was under a tent. Uh, he did inform me he got sunburned today. Uh, due to the angle of the sun and uh, where the tent was, and, and so like he was literally under a tent in the in the bleachers with fans sitting beside him, uh, making noise. So com- completely unprofessional. It's just, uh, it's just I, I don't know. Like it, it's hard, it's hard for me to get mad at ECU for going on the road to these crappy places and like not bringing the energy they should bring because. It, when you play at Clark Claire Stadium or you play UNC and then all of a sudden you're having to go to these crappy venues, it's just I, I think it would be hard to maintain that energy. I don't I know they don't want to use excuses, guys, and I don't want to be too white collar here. Um, like Cliff Godwin would say, you know, they need to get back and more be more blue collar. But I think it's just it's frustrating to deal with this stuff, uh, Wags. Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, maybe UCF, Houston and Cincinnati were so bad and I mean, that's saying something because, man, they were bad. <laughs> so, I mean, it, yeah, it's embarrassing. It's a terrible look all around when, you know, you look at UTSA and the playing surface itself is terrible. And then I think calling FAU set up a middle school setup would be a compliment. Um, yeah, you know, and everyone's got their things. You know, ECU's blessed with great facilities, great stadium, and we've been to some good ones. But – and you talk – you talk bad about, you know, whoever, you know, NC State's press box. Again, UTSA, FAU, um, you got to do something, but it's a product of it's your first year in the American and baseball wasn't the prominent – baseball wasn't a reason for those teams joining the league. So, you know, it is what it is. It's year one. But in the end, I don't know. What are you going to do about it? That's my question. And ideally you say, you know, fix your shit. But is that going to happen? Probably not, and but it's bad. You know, playbook play guys shouldn't be sitting out in the hot sun, especially in Florida when – I mean <laughs> – but, I mean, you know, you're sitting out there and, like me, you know, just think, if Scooter's out there calling a game and he gets really into it, you know, he's probably sweating his butt off in there and get, get, get us with AC in a press box. You should, we're asking for the bare minimum here. Wags almost got cut off from the internet for cussing on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's getting close to 9.53. You are freezing up. You did freeze up uh, there. Um, uh, that's somebody. Uh, usually, it, usually it shows me on my end, and you guys yeah. freeze up. You were so fired up, you didn't even realize it. Um, he had to call himself out. <laughs> nationally ranked ECU Don says, I goes an elitist now. Get him some wine and cheese and some baby blue. Hey, maybe I am, but it, I think it goes back to uh, East Carolina, man. They treat the media so well, and it's like, I mean, we take what we get for granted, especially with baseball. Uh, and Scott, you know, even with our broadcast, man, like the camera work, I mean, it's just uh, – it, it just makes the conference feel extremely small time when ECU is playing on the road at these schools. And, 
That's a shame. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a level of professionalism and what's acceptable that you should expect, not just in baseball, but in, in every sport. Because, you know, what these, these student-athletes work so hard, and they deserve to have these things and their, and their talent displayed in a way that is meaningful and not just slapped together because they have to put the broadcast on ESPN+. And, you know, having Scooter outside – is is ridiculous. I mean, I think that the AC, the AAC should, you know, look into. Hey, if you're going to be in this league, these are the facility upgrades you need to make and make it a priority. Now, I will say that I thought as a a fellow uh, international harvester aficionado that Scooter would be a little more resistant to the sun, um, but I guess he didn't spend enough time on his IH uh, to to build up that natural immunity to the sun. Uh, but or maybe the Boca Sun's a little bit hotter than uh, the Greenville Sun. Uh, but you know, like even Menji's, I think on our end is something that needs to be upgraded. And if we're we're looking internally, then you know UTSA having a field that represents the league in the way that it does is a bad look. FAU UAB not having facilities for their guests is a bad look. And if that was us, I would be upset with us too because you know. If a fan is listening to a baseball game, that's a real fan. And to give them a bad product because you just don't care enough about the sport is unacceptable at this level. Maybe it's acceptable in Conference USA, but it's not here. And you've moved up. You're getting more money than ever. Put it back where it belongs in resources for the student athletes and resources for your fans and not just you know, lining the pockets of ADs and coaches. Well said all the way around. Uh, Richard Diaz says, get him an AC for his butt. Uh, as, as Wag said. Um, Les, yeah, we do have to shout out the mullet, ECU mullet fan. He got some airtime today. So we'll say a shout out to the FAU production crew for that. And they welcomed him into the uh, production truck uh, golf Yoda says, if I was the dude with the mullet, I would have asked the production crew, why are y'all treating me so well? It was like, he was the make a wish kid. Um, so yeah, that was interesting. If, uh, if, if mullet dude is, is listening or watching, let us know what your real name is. Cause we want to give you, uh, give you some love. Uh, Bobby Hayes says portable bathrooms for the fans at FAU this weekend. So, I mean, what, that's just sad, man. I mean, uh, somebody asked me, I go, do you know how Charlotte's facilities are? I don't. As far as baseball, I've never been to baseball. Basketball facilities, great. Football, we'll find out this fall. Um, Cage says, ECU mullet dude played football for ECU. I thought he looked familiar, but I I need to see if I can find his name. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, we haven't talked, guys, about We'd have to do our predictions for the complete. We have not talked about uh, Jacob Starlin a lot as far as mi missing the uh, the series with an oblique injury. Um, trying to get Star on the show tomorrow. I don't know if that's going to happen. We are scheduled to have Carter Cunningham on HTC uh, on 94 through the game. Um, but Cliff Goblin said it's an oblique deal day to day. Not exactly sure what happened, but we did see Colby Wallace at third and Dixon Williams at second. And uh, I like that look, uh, Wags. What did you think about, you know, kind of a new look infield? Yeah, and with Starling, you know, I'm I'm just assuming that it happened against State. I think I hit by a pitch around that area um, late in the game. He stayed in. He stole a base after that. But my guess is it probably tightened up, didn't feel right. But that's just me speculating. So don't take that for any sort of worth. Um, but, yeah, I think it was interesting. You know, I think a lot of us have been saying, you know, we want to see different combinations. Um, I think a lot of us had shortstop in mind with Dixon sliding over, but Dixon going to second and Colby at third, I thought it was a good look. Um, obviously, Dixon's first go around at second, I thought he looked fine. He made a couple of tough plays. Um, again, wasn't perfect. I didn't think he was tested a whole lot at second, um, to be honest. But Colby, Colby Wallace looked really good at third. And you guys know me. I'm going to shout out my Pinecrest boys whenever I can. But, you know, Colby got his opportunity and about a clean up, too, on Saturday and in the five hole today. But Colby's got an arm. And that's the guy we're talking about, bullpen woes. And Colby Wallace last year had a .52 ERA at Pinecrest. He's a three-time conference pitcher of the year in high school. So that's a guy that could 
get opportunities. But I think his bat, like we said earlier, he grinds out at bats. He's never going to go down easy. He might strike out, but he's going to make the pitcher throw six, seven, eight pitches. And that's valuable, especially in a lineup that I think sometimes struggles to do that. So, and it's a righty. We, we've talked so much about lefty heavy lineup, but I like the look. I want to see him more moving forward. Obviously not at the expense of an injury. I want Starling back in there as soon as he can, but you know, maybe use that DH spot to give Starling some days off in the field moving forward. And you try that out or, you know, Dixon DH, Colby DH. Again, I think you have, you have opportunities to kind of mix that in. So, but yeah, it was, it was nice to see something different and it worked out well. And again, you never know when you're going to get your opportunity and when you're going to need it. So it was really encouraging to see, I thought. The arm strength from Colby Wallace at third, I mean, is night and day. Um, you know, you can just tell his ability to throw across the diamond with zip is, you know, big big league caliber, I think. Um, I still, you know, Dixon made some plays in the hole at second, like almost in the shift towards short. Like, to me, I, I would not mind a combination where uh, Dixon Williams at short, Colby Wallace at third, Starlin at second, just to see what it looks like. And Barini did hit the ball better this weekend. Um, and his bat's coming around, but I wouldn't mind seeing that for a game or two just to see what, what it looks like. Uh, what, do, what do you think about that, uh, Scott? Yeah, I think we saw a lot of the future this weekend when Dixon, uh, Bristol Carter, and uh, Colby Wallace. I think those are three guys that are going to be hitting in the middle of the lineup here for a long time. And like you said, Dixon made a couple plays going up the middle that looked like a third baseman um, as far as range and arm strength. So, you know, if he can if he can translate that to short, then that that offensive lineup I think is going to be much more uh, powerful than uh, one with Barini in it. But Barini tore the cover off the ball this weekend. I'll give credit where credit's due. He hit the ball hard all weekend. Um, hopefully, he can keep doing it. And uh, if he does, I think he's going to be kind of permanent markered in to shortstop. But you know, looking forward to to next year and the year after. That um, that core of Carter Williams and uh, Wallace, I think, is going to be really important for East Carolina. All right, a couple more comments we'll hit on before we move into the next week. Johnny Robertson says opponents are committing errors at a ridiculous rate. Ten in the three wins this past week, and twenty in the nine AAC games. I think some of that is related to ECU hitting the ball on the ground so much and having some speed, um, but also just not great baseball in this conference. And I don't think NC State's really ever been a great defensive team. They're more hit the ball, score a bunch of runs. How about State, by the way, 0-4? Somebody also commented, Scott, did ECU break NC State? And as our resident NC State fan, I should ask you, what do you think? I believe so. Um, they look terrible against Louisville. And um, even against us, they just seemed overmatched in a way that I don't know I've seen them look, especially at home against us in the last 15 years. Uh, but they're reeling. I think they have Clemson uh, on the road next weekend, followed by UNC. And, you know, they're a team that's ranked 19th right now, probably won't be ranked tomorrow. And you struggle on those next two weekends, you know, you start looking more towards a, a bubble team come tournament time. And, and I don't think their schedule gets any easier I know they have Florida State left, and I'm not sure who else, maybe Wake Forest or Duke. But, you know, ACC play is going to be really tough for them going forward. Louisville was certainly the worst team they had left. And, you know, to go 0-3, it, it kind of, you know, looking at it, it's, it's bad for us if State doesn't play well, if they are in the round of 500-type team. Uh, it's, it's not good for our resume. But, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of faith that they – they can turn things around uh, living off the the long ball and, you know, Sam Highfield. Um, somebody asked earlier if the Mariners are going to make the World Series or when are they? Uh, not this year based on how they are playing. They uh, look like the Seattle Mariners. So they're, slow they're the only team. Yeah, they always start slow. They'll go on a run in July and then miss the playoffs by a game. And then I'll be excited for next year again. Um. Nationals suck, and they didn't win today. And the Reds are mediocre, doing fairly well. Yeah, yeah, they're like I don't know what their record is. They're probably around five hundred, though. I think they lost today. So thank God ECU is good. Um, 
Chris Allen says he's going to the Masters Sunday. Congrats, Chris. Awesome. Or Saturday, Saturday, he says. So uh, I'm very jealous. Um, Cade Sean says mullet dude played football and dad played baseball. Said he was from Raleigh and now lives in the Boca area as teacher and high school football coach. Okay. We still don't have a mullet dude name, but uh, good. Um, FAU Athletics, according to Johnny Robertson, uses the slogan, winning in paradise. That takes my disdain for them to another level. Um, they also were the only FBS team to lose to ECU in football this year in paradise. So that's another tough mark against them. Um, let's see, make sure I'm not missing any good comments here. I go, are you a Mariners fan because of their super team in the late nineties? I'm a Mariners fan because of King Griffey Jr. Absolute legend. Uh, he's the reason I love baseball, but, uh, so in a way, yes, although he left in that time and they were actually better after he left. Um, and the Reds were all right. worse once he got there. And the Reds were worse cause he got hurt all the time, but him and Adam Dome are fun to watch. That's true. They hit a lot of Jay bombs. Ruth. Yes. All right. I think we, we made it through the comments, at least most of the, the good ones. Somebody did say that uh, I've never seen Wags' eyes so open. looks like his eyeballs are coming out of a socket. Um, Look, maybe you I'm just fired, fired up. up this one. Maybe, maybe so. Somebody said he looked like he was ready for the eclipse, which I thought was uh, <laughs> He's ready for the eclipse. <laughs> you know, it's that time of the year. We're, we're uh, past the halfway point, and I'll use this as time for the self-plug. Um, follow me on Twitter. J underscore wag 74 tomorrow. I'm publishing my first field of 64. My first official I've been doing fields all year, but tomorrow I'm publishing my first of the season. Um, I'll probably have ECU as a top 10 seed. So just a little preview there. So watch out for my Twitter. I'll tweet it probably tomorrow afternoon by the time I finish it. But so yeah, just had to get that in. Definitely check that out. Uh, Wags doing great work for all three sports as they continue to steal off 24 seven sports top employees. Um, I do want to add uh, too. we did get multiple comments about the top 25. Um, where do y'all think ECU slots in tomorrow? And does Florida finally tumble after being swept by Missouri? Uh, we'll start whoever wants to start it off. Yeah, I'll just, I'll wrap up real quick, but I, I have ECU at eight. I can see them anywhere from eight to 10. I don't see any lower than that. I don't see any higher than that. Um, so I have ECU at eight. Um, Vanderbilt moves up to six. Duke moves up to seven. Vir uh, ECU jumps up to eight. eight. Virginia nine. I have Kentucky jumping up to 10. So I could see a couple of those switching around a spot or two, but I, I don't, I think it'd be eight or nine probably. Um, and Florida, yeah, I think they're going to free fall. They're going to stay in the top 25. I think they're going to be right around that 20 mark. I think I have them at 18 in my predictions that I published tonight. Um, but, again, that can move up a spot or two. Um, if Coastal swept, I probably have Coastal. I've, I think I have Coastal one spot behind them. But that range, I think, is about right, even though I wouldn't be upset if they were a little lower. What yeah, do you I think, uh, Scott? Yeah, I have them at eight as well. Um, I actually have Kentucky at nine. I think uh, Kentucky – Finally winning a, a quality SEC series against Alabama. Um, they'll, they'll shoot up the polls. This is the week for them to do it. I have uh, DBU dropping down to 13 um, as far as like the, the non-traditional power schools. And then Louisiana jumping in. Um, LSU is a team that I'm, I'm kind of surprised. I, I had them out when I made my top 25. I think South Carolina is another team that is maybe in, maybe out. You know, they, they've lost back-to-back -back weekends against really good teams, but if you if you lose to really good teams, you know, you're still going to have to slide some. Uh, I think Oregon or maybe Utah out of the Pac-12 is going to be a team that jumps in. I know for me it was Oregon. I think the Wags it was Utah. Um, but it'll be somebody from the Pac-12. You'll see schools like UCF and Nebraska to undeservedly continue to climb. Um, then, uh, you know, there's – uh, let's see, as far as Florida, yeah, I had them at 18 too. So um, I'll be interested to see where Wake goes. Um, Wake had fallen all the way into the 20s, uh, picked up a, a really good series win at Virginia Tech. Or, or was it at home? It might have been at home versus Virginia Tech. But um, Virginia Tech's not a school that I think is really that good. I think they've just moved up the polls by being in the ACC and, and beating teams that they should beat. Um, and now they finally started to play some some better competition, and we'll see how far they they fall after getting swept. Um, 
but yeah, yeah, NC State out, LSU out, um, which is it's really kind of a shock. Um, we don't even have to talk about Iowa um, and how they are terrible at baseball, um, despite being kind of a preseason regional host. So um, the, there'll be a lot of movement again this week, and I'm really glad we won because this is a week that was really an opportunity for us to move up a lot. And previously, when we've had these opportunities to move up a lot, we've uh, joined the teams that did not move up and had the bad weeks and kind of been involved in the chaos. So enjoy it because it is uh, not always the case. We'll be interested to see where exactly ECU falls in Monday's rankings. If you're listening to the podcast version uh, after Monday morning, you probably already know. Um, I should also mention the conference race, guys, at this point. I thought the top of the league would separate itself further from the bottom, but really you just kind of got a cluster now. Uh, UTSA wins two out of three against Charlotte. They're 7-2 in first place. ECU, 6-3, and three, does gain a game on FAU um, by winning the series. South Florida went from 3-3 three and three to 6-3 and three by sweeping Wichita State, so that kind of – uh, it switched up the standings as USF now tied with ECU for second. Wichita State, which entered the weekend five and one, goes down to five and four. And then Memphis swept Rice on the road, so Memphis is now five and four. So you got six teams separated by two games, and then Charlotte there at four and five. Rice terrible. Wags this conference, um, you know, still what we were doing the math prior to the show. There's 27 conference games this year which I think is more than there ever has been. And there's an inbound schedule. ECU actually plays five home series uh, compared to four road series. So you, you you have all that to factor in. Still a very long way to go in this race. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, you look at recent play and UTSA and ECU are both eight and two in the last 10 games and South Florida is seven and three. Everyone else is, well, except for Rice, Tulane, and UAB at the bottom. Everyone else is pretty much 500 in the last 10 games. So, there's not a lot of separating like we talked about last week. Um, but, yeah, I think the home home heavy schedule down the stretch, it'll only benefit ECU, um, especially on the weekends. Um, I'm going to be more comfortable. I'm going to be picking more sweeps than I am two-to-ones uh, moving forward because I love this team at home, always have, always will. Um, so, yeah, it's there's a lot of game left. and But, yeah, ECU needs to take care of business. They need to start sweeping because – you know, UTSA, I think, is a team that's going to hang around. I don't think they're as good as number one in the AAC, but I do think UTSA is a team that can hang around in the 2 3 range and, you know, not be completely out of reach if ECU was to get on a roll. So it's tight, and ECU needs to keep winning. Scott, do you think UTSA, you know, legitimately being a threat to ECU now? I, I kind of said it reminded me of the Houston series last year when they lost, and it took until the very end of the year for ECU to pass Houston. Um, is it a good thing though that it makes ECU kind of really play well and not take a day off? Yeah, you look at their next three series and they are Memphis, UAB, Rice, who are all three at the bottom of the conference. So that's you know nine games where I would think they would go at least six and three. So if we're going two and one every weekend, we're not going to gain any ground. Um, so I'm I'm hoping that that's something that they're keenly aware of. You know, we're a game behind and they have the tiebreaker. So we're really two games behind. And we're going to have to, to, like Wag said, start sweeping some of these teams. Um, you know, Charlotte's a team that I think we have an opportunity to sweep. Wichita State just got swept on the road. But that's a team that really put us in a world of hurt last year at their place. So when they come here, we owe them one. Um, same thing with, uh, you know, Tulane pushed us to the brink last year um, at home and then obviously in the conference tournament. So we owe them one too. So – there's some some revenge factored in for our, our remaining conference series. And I do think, um, especially after this weekend, it really opens up as far as our level of difficulty is going to drop some in our conference series. And, you know, the majority of them are at home. All right, let's get into our, uh, our last uh, or the upcoming week discussion and predictions. It is a five-game week for East Carolina. The Pirates will take on Elon on Tuesday at home, ODU on Wednesday at home, and then host Charlotte in the three-game series. Also got the spring game Saturday, so it's going to be a crazy weekend inside uh, Clark and Clare Stadium inside uh, Greenville. 
uh, around the campus. So bold predictions. Uh, last week I went Jackson DiLorenzo would have a winning pitching decision. Uh, he did not pitch at all. Uh, so therefore I busted uh, Scott, went with Cliff Goblin, would get ejected. That busted. He's still not gotten ejected this season. Jonathan Wagner went with Dixon Williams, three extra base hits. He had one on Tuesday and then did not have another, correct? Yep, he almost had two on Tuesday. So I, I was looking real good there for a minute. He had a uh, single hey, we, advanced the second on the throw, too. So right. You got like half credit there. Yeah, it's uh, hey, they, they don't call them bold predictions for uh, for no reason. I mean, these are long shots to a degree. Um, so let's get, none of us had three and one, right? We all went two and two last week for yep. record prediction. So ECU proved us wrong, uh, there, uh, in a good manner. Uh, so let's go five game week prediction. We will, uh, we'll start there. And, um, I don't understand. EC Pirate Nation is asking who just got a Venmo payment. Are, Anybody understanding that? I don't know. Uh, please elaborate, Pirate Nation. Um, all right, so we'll go uh, around the horn. What do we think ECU does this week as far as record first, uh, Wax? Yeah, um, I, I think it was Skull Pirate earlier that asked if I would shave my head if Charlotte goes 3-0. The answer is no. Um, but I do think that's what's going to happen. And maybe I'm crazy, but I'm, I'm going to go with a 5-0 and week. I just think – it's a big week, and I think that's why. You know, big moment, big home weekend, you know, with the spring game on Saturday, too. It adds a little juice to the mix. But 2-0, I think they're going to 2-0 in the midweeks, um, 3-0 against Charlotte. I think it's going to be a great week for the offense all around, um, with or without Starling. I, th- I think the offense is going to have a very good week. And are we going bold predictions now, too, or – Let's uh, we'll circle back for bowl predictions. Right. So, let's, so uh, Scott, what do you got for record? I go four and one. I think we talked about it a lot, especially at the beginning of uh, the show. But we haven't seen enough bullpen arms for me to trust us to have five games worth of pitching. And you know, Charlotte's a team that can score runs. You know, they they've been in a lot of high scoring games. And if you know we get to that fifth game, and you know, Danny Bill can't pitch in all five. Shink can't pitch in four out of five. I, I have a hard time ha- having faith in us, not having seen the guys at the very end of our bullpen to to go five and zero. Oh. So uh, I'll say four and one. Yeah, I'm gonna go four and one as well. Charlotte has not been swept this season. They honestly have played a really tough schedule. Uh, you know, they they won one versus Virginia Tech. They split four versus West Virginia. 1-1 one, one at Old Dominion, 1-1 one, one against Maryland, 1-1 one, one against UNCW, 1-1 one, one against FAU, 1-1 um, one, one at UTSA. So they're really good at winning one game, and uh, I think it'll be tough to sweep them, although it would be a big you know thing for the standings if ECU could sweep them. So I'm going to go 4-1. ECU does win both midweeks and then loses one to Charlotte. Um, but I agree with Wags. I think the offense will get humming this week. Uh, so let's go bowl predictions and also – I guess ECU Pirate Nation heard a cash register sound, so that's what he's saying. Um, he heard the payment. So who got paid? Somebody got paid through Venmo? It wasn't me. me. I looked to make sure, yeah. too. Uh, it was not me as well. So maybe you got paid, uh, ECU Pirate Nation. Uh, check your uh, check your notifications. He says, we need to sweep Charlotte. I'm so tired of their annoying fans. Um, all right, bold prediction, Wags, what do you got? All right. Well, I'm going to go to, I think pitching has been a big topic this week and someone who pitched really well this past week was Aaron Grohler on Tuesday against state. And I'm going to kind of double up on him and I'm going to say, he's going to make two appearances this week. I think he's going to start um, one of the midweeks. If I had to guess, I don't know that, but that's my guess. But my prediction is he's going to go, he's going to pitch two times this week and he's not going to allow a run. All right. I like it. Uh, Scott, we got, ECU will score double-digit runs at least twice this week. I think um, this is, the weather's warming up. The balls are going to start flying out of the stadium, and now's the time for our uh, bats to come alive and the home run ball to be a factor for ECU once again. Uh, Brad Williams says Eric Ritchie throws a perfect game. <laughs> now that is bold uh, for sure. Um, I'll shave my head if that happens. <laughs> I will as well. We'll all shave our head. 
Um, I have no idea what I'm going to go with here. Uh, I'm just I'm searching through the brain, trying to come up with a good prediction to make. I'm going to go. Has Joey Barini hit a home run this season? One, I believe. I'm going to go with uh, Joey Barini hits a home run this week. And also, double whammy, Colby Wallace hits his first career homer as well. Wow. Um, so the That's odds, cool. if I'm going parlay here, say what? I said you should just go whole infield hits a home run. <laughs> whole infield hits a home run. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, if, if Barini and Wallace hit one, there's probably a good chance it happens. But I'll stick with uh, I'll stick with Colby and Barini, and uh, hopefully it's warm weather. Hopefully the wind is not blowing in like my last home run prediction. I really need to stop predicting home runs with this team. But hey, we don't learn from our mistakes. Um, anything to add, guys? Are we good to get out of here? This has been a long show. I think we're all good. Yeah, great week. <laughs> Good job, yeah. I mean, we talked about it going in three and one. You set yourself up for great success. And ECU has done that. They have done what they need to do. They're 23 and seven through 30 games um, in great shape. Obviously still got a lot of ball left, a lot of winning to do to get to where they want to go. But I think this team is in good position, 30 games into the season. All right, we're going to get out of here. And I uh, appreciate all the interaction. Uh, ECU Pirate Nation, by the way, says Trey no hits Charlotte Friday night. That is his bold prediction. And Johnny Robertson adds the Pirates are playing eight games in 10 days. They're going to need everyone in the bullpen to contribute to some degree. All right, we're going to get out of here. This is uh, Stephen Igo for Jonathan Wagner and Scott Lorbacher. This has been the Bucks on the Wild podcast. We'll be back next Sunday night, 9 o'clock. We'll talk to you then. I uh, appreciate you guys tuning in.